Good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for the Government of Newfoundland and Labrador's COVID-19 update for today, Wednesday, March 31st. Hard to believe. I'll now turn things over to uh, Dr. Fitzgerald uh, for today, an update on today's numbers. Thank you, Premier. Good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Um, since the media advisory yesterday, we have one new confirmed case of COVID-19 in our province in the Eastern Health Region, and the individual is between the ages of 40 and 49, and the source of this case is under investigation at this time. The total number of cases in our province is 1,019. There have been two new recoveries in Eastern Health, leading to three active cases in the province. A total of 124,261 people have been tested to date. Whole genome sequencing has identified that one of the cases we recently reported was a COVID variant, the variant that was first discovered in South Africa, B1351. The case was travel related and the individual properly self-isolated and had no contacts. We are confident there was no onward transmission and no danger to public safety. We are asking that all passengers and crew who traveled on the Marine Atlantic vessel Atlantic Vision from North Sydney to Port of Bass Saturday night, March 27th, arriving on Sunday morning, March 28th, to arrange for COVID test. We are making this request out of an abundance of caution related to a case announced yesterday. These individuals should book their test using the online assessment and referral tool in our website, on our website and indicate the reason was due to a public advisory. We are a few days into level two across the province with Easter weekend approaching, as well as Easter break for students. The Easter Bunny is of course an essential worker and will be permitted to enter the province. Visits with the Easter Bunny in large public venues such as shopping malls are not recommended. If the Easter Bunny does visit a public space, any in-person visits should be by appointment only with no lineups forming. Individuals must maintain six feet between themselves and the Easter Bunny. Easter is, a tradi is traditionally a time for many to gather with family and friends to attend or to attend faith-based gatherings. While we encourage you to connect with your loved ones and participate in activities that are important to you, please do so safely. In this new level two, we need to keep our close contacts as low as possible. You should maintain your close social interactions to a maximum of 20 people for your household. And these should be consistent and they should not change from day to day or week to week. By close interactions, we mean indoors, without a mask, in close proximity to one another, such as those seated together at a restaurant or in a home. Remember that you should not bring all your 20 close contacts together at one time as they are li not likely all in each other's bubbles. If you do host a gathering, keep it small and ensure everyone is a close contact of one another. Any gatherings should be distanced as much as possible, meaning people should be able to stay at least six feet away from each other. And the amount of space you will, you will have, you have will determine the number of people that can safely attend. Sharing food or serving utensils is not recommended as this may increase the risk of transmission of COVID-19. If food is necessary, have one individual designated to serve food after washing their hands and while serving, while wearing a non-medical non mask. There should be no self-serve options such as trays of cookies, bowls of chips, or potlucks. If the weather permits, choose outdoor interactions over indoors. Further guidance is available on our website under holiday gatherings holiday events and gatherings. It is important to repeat why we are asking for everyone's cooperation in this. In the last outbreak, there was clear and rapid spread of the variant through households, social circles, sports events, workplaces, and schools. We were living as if COVID were not here, and that did contribute to the swift spread. We must always assume that COVID can be anywhere and please, if you have any symptoms of COVID-19, even if it is just one mild symptom, book a COVID test using the online assessment and referral tool. We are now receiving a steady supply of vaccine. Approximately 63,000 doses have been administered and almost 10,000 individuals have been fully vaccinated. Regional health authorities are expanding to additional priority groups as vaccine becomes available. If you are over the age of 70 and have pre-registered for your vaccine, but have not yet been contacted, please know that you will be soon. If you did not include an email in your registration form, you will be contacted by phone. 
Other priority groups may be receiving vaccine at similar times, but once you become eligible, you are always eligible. You will not be left out. If you receive an email to book an appointment and there is no appointment available, please continue to check back as clinics are being added regularly. Please note that the pre-registration telephone line is available only for pre-registration and the individuals staffing the line cannot book your appointment for a vaccination. The line has seen significant increase in, uh, in traffic in recent days. As a recap, for those who may have just joined us, we have one new confirmed case since yesterday's media advisory, and the total number of cases in the province is 1,019. This time of year is always hopeful. We hope for an early spring and a pleasant summer, and this year we are once again hopeful that we'll, we will see an improvement in the COVID-19 pandemic globally. Let's focus our attention on controlling what we can, protecting one another, and keeping COVID at bay. Hold fast, Newfoundland and Labrador. Thank you. Well, thank you, Dr. Fitzgerald. Well, we are in the last day of the third month of the year. And while it's cold, it's another beautiful day here in St. John's. The days are getting noticeably longer. And this coming weekend, many people across the province will celebrate Easter. It's another sure sign that spring and eventually summer is here. With the recent easing of public health restrictions for the whole province, I hope you get a chance to safely spend time with your friends and family. As summer is fast approaching and more people are getting their vaccinations, you can sense, as Dr. Fitzgerald said, that hope and optimism about returning to a more, a no more normal lifestyle is in the air. I know the recent change in the guidance of the AstraZeneca vaccine may be concerning, but I want to reassure you that the chances of those issues arising are still incredibly slim. Federally and provincially, everyone is pivoting quickly to ensure people get vaccinated as quickly as possible. And we are getting there too. But as we have said many times, we must continue to learn to live with COVID-19 by following the guidelines set forth by Dr. Fitzgerald and her team at Public Health. So with that, I'll turn it over to Dr. Hagee for some brief remarks. Minister Hagee. Thank you very much, uh, <coughs> Premier. Um, uh, a little update on vaccine as of uh, our report, uh, which is uh, compiled on a weekly basis uh, of the morning of the 29th. We've administered uh, 62,849 doses. Uh, we are currently about 600 um, dose administrations behind our target. We've had several clinics, particularly on the western side of the island, cancelled due to weather. Uh, we're expecting uh, just under 17,000 doses of Pfizer. And in actual fact, those arrived uh, yesterday. Uh, and the need, I'm informed, in central health, they're actually being administered uh, as we speak. Um, we're also expecting this weekend another 8,400 doses of Moderna vaccine. So we are on track for our uh, April 4th Easter weekend target of 80,000 doses administered. There may be a little bit of slippage because of the weather, but I would expect we'll be within a thousand of that, even on the worst case scenarios. We're also, because of the reliability of Pfizer's supply chain, on track for uh, Canada Day, Memorial Day, to have um, a, a shot in the arm of every eligible person who wants a COVID vaccine. That has not changed. Uh, and indeed, uh, there are some suggestions that we could actually have already started administering second doses uh, by that time too. Um, for those people who are concerned uh, about their appointments, um, I know that uh, Eastern Health is uh, releasing a statement very shortly, uh, as has Central Health. Um, if you have pre-registered, there is no need to call. You will not be forgotten. Uh, the uh, clinics are being rolled out, uh, and I think uh, we've spoken to the RHAs to try and make sure those appointments uh, and the availability geographically uh, spans a, a long enough period, say four or five weeks, whereby people can pick and choose a little bit about where they would see uh, the geography working best for them so they're not having to drive, particularly for some of the frailer uh, over 70s. Um, we will notify uh, people uh, via this means at the end of that uh, process when everybody who is in that age group of 70 plus uh, has been vaccinated. Currently, Eastern Health are telling me they will have offered a vaccine to everybody over 70 in Eastern Health by April 23rd. 
So the fact you haven't heard simply means they haven't got round to you yet. No one has forgotten you. Um, it is uh, a time of the year where family get together, uh, and uh, there are a variety of religious traditions uh, at this time of the year. Some people, however, are still significantly stressed, uh, either over uh, their own mental wellness issues or around COVID and its stresses, or indeed around vaccines. Um, there are resources available to you. BridgeTheGap.ca is a homegrown one. Uh, doorways for those who uh, uh, would prefer something in person. Uh, there is also our federal counterpart at Wellness Together, or one word, .ca, uh, which provides services um, uh, of a similar nature uh, online and via phone. Uh, it also provides um, ready access uh, for those whose first language is not English, particularly our indigenous uh, residents uh, and those uh, from, uh, from uh, other countries uh, who are first-generation Canadians. So I would recommend that to you as well. So if it uh, is your tradition, then happy Easter. Uh, if not, uh, then I hope you have a, a peaceful weekend. Um, uh, I uh, am advised by communications that we will not be issuing news releases over the uh, holiday weekend, Friday, Saturday, or Sunday, and we will resume on Monday. Obviously, if the situation changes, uh, and there's a need, uh, we, will, uh, we will take that as it comes and we'll uh, make that information available uh, publicly. Uh, so with that, uh, Premier, happy Easter and back to you. Well, thank you, Minister. I'll now invite uh, questions from the media. Thank you, Premier. For the benefit of our speakers, there are five reporters registered for today's call. The question and answer session will be conducted in two rounds where each reporter will have the opportunity to ask one question and one follow-up per round. Following this, I will ask each reporter if they have one final question. Our first questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, it's looking like Western and Eastern Health allowing for AstraZeneca clinics at the end of this week to move through the limited amount that's about to expire. The age range for that is 55 to 64. Just wondering... Um, why that particular age range and why the cutoff would be 64? Um, just basically because we had said before that uh, anyone over the age of uh, 65 with a higher risk of, uh, um, you know, severe complications from the, uh, um, from COVID would uh, be eligible for the mRNA vaccine. So we are targeting uh, people in that age group for the AstraZeneca. Thank you. And Minister Hagee, you noted that anyone who's pre-registered, not to worry, you haven't been forgotten. I'm still hearing for a lot from a lot over the age of 85 who have not yet received an appointment. They're obviously getting concerned that they have been forgotten having pre-registered when it first opened, I want to say more than a month ago at this point. Why aren't we moving through it um, by age range at this point if Eastern Health is now looking to start contacting for 7079 when there's some who are 86, 87 who haven't been uh, booked yet? Um, I think the important thing is that some of that is dependent on geography, uh, and I think it would be very much down to local context around that. Um, some of those uh, individuals, uh, if they have had difficulties, they have a, a code uh, for registering, obviously, but they also have contact for their local public health. Um, my understanding is that it is simply a, a process of, of rolling these out. We are pre-registering 70-year-olds, but currently administering 85 and 80-year-olds, and then working back. So there may, be, uh, there may be some local challenges in terms of availability of clinics, but we've had a discussion with the RHAs today to make sure there is a geographical variation uh, so that people, particularly of that age, don't have to drive um, any further than they need to. So uh, uh, that's probably the, the clearest answer I can offer just at the moment. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, I have a couple of questions about AstraZeneca. Um, why are we still not offering this to anyone over the age of 65, given the new guidelines? I, well, I, th I think it's the same answer that I said to Kelly's an Kellyanne's first question, which is uh, we've decided that, uh, you know, people at higher risk will get an mRNA vaccine. 
uh, high risk for severe disease. And so, um, you know, we certainly see a gradient over 65. So uh, we are offering AstraZeneca to 55 to 64 uh, at this point. So. Uh, so are we, should we expect more of these parallel vaccination clinics like we're getting this week? Uh, we may very well have those as we get more vaccines uh, online. You know, we have, um, there are other vaccines in the queue that we will likely be getting as the months go on. So uh, we may find that uh, some are more suitable for one group than another. And so we may be using them. Uh, there may very well be parallel streams. Okay, thank you. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with VOCM. Please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, new information from Pfizer. Uh, they're saying that their vaccine is 100% effective in kids age 12 to 15. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, what do you know about this and how could this affect our rollout plan? Uh, so I know about it, likely what you know about it. <laughs> um, so uh, we've not received any uh, you know, formal indication of that. Um, as generally happens, it's not that there's anything out of the ordinary happening there. Um, but, uh, you know, we look forward to uh, Pfizer's reports on, on what the, uh, um, how well the vaccine uh, performed in that age group. Uh, obviously, it's a, that's a big deal for us, for everybody, uh, to be able to administer vaccines to this age group. So uh, we'll certainly be looking forward to those reports um, when they come out. And, uh, uh, you know, once Health Canada has a chance to review that and, and the National Advisory Committee on Immunization has a chance to look at it, then we'll take, we'll take direction or their cues from them as to how best to use it. And still getting a lot of concerns from people regarding uh, booking their vaccination appointments by phone. Um, I heard from someone this morning in the 80-plus age group who said she's been trying repeatedly to get through by phone to book her vaccination appointment but hasn't been able to get through. Um, what sort of backlog are we seeing in terms of people calling to book vaccinations, and what is government planning to do to address those backlogs? From the point of view of um, the call center, I do know that several things have happened. One is they've increased the number of staff available uh, to handle calls, and that they're also trying to divide those staff out to take a slightly more regionalized uh, approach. One of the challenges that they are having is that that phone line is being bombarded by people uh, who are asking if they've successfully registered, uh, and it's proving to be uh, taxing. Uh, so uh, that's part of Dr. Fitzgerald's comment and mine about using the phones appropriately. Um, if you have registered and got a screen that says you've successfully pre-registered, uh, or in some jurisdictions now, I believe Eastern Health are actually sending out email confirmation for those people who have used uh, that method, um, that uh, really there is no need to call. Uh, Eastern Health, uh, as of an hour ago, uh, say that they will have uh, offered appointments to everybody in the 70-plus group by the 23rd of April, um, and the other RHAs are committing to get uh, back to people who have pre-registered within a 14 to 21 day window as well, and they will be providing updates on that. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. Um, Minister, I want to just ask about uh, the 80,000 threshold. Uh, originally, you were saying that by the end of March, we were expecting to administer 80,000 doses. Um, it's now, it now, I noticed you were saying it looks more like it'll be the Easter weekend. Uh, can you give me an idea of when exactly do you expect to reach that threshold and why didn't we reach it by the end of March as expected? My comments over the last 10 days, probably even two weeks, Peter, have been 80,000 by Easter. Uh, and uh, we've always worked internally after my initial comments with April 4th as a deadline. Uh, two factors play into to that. Uh, one principally has been the weather uh, on the, uh, the West Coast, and then there were some initial concerns about whether or not we would be able to backfill uh, the younger group uh, for um, uh, uh, the uh, first responders with mRNA vaccine, and then whether that would leave us short for, uh, for that. But between the, the jigs and the reels, uh, we will be, I think, somewhere within 
a 600 to 1,000 margin by the fourth. So I'm hoping it will be 80,000, but I won't be surprised if it was 79 and uh, change. Uh, and I want to ask about schools. Um, they've said with the current guidance that high school classes can't resume in person. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, do you expect to change that guidance at all over the next couple of months until uh, we have people vaccinated, considering our, our case numbers right now have returned to very low levels, and a lot of people are frustrated about the fact that uh, their kids are not able to go back to class? Yeah, so certainly we've uh, been having discussions about that. And, uh, you know, we made our guidance based on what we know about variants. We know that there, that, uh, you know, a significant proportion of the cases we're seeing now in the rest of the country are due to variants. And Ontario is somewhere between 60 and 70 percent of their cases are variants. Um, and uh, so that's a concern because it does mean that any of these imported cases, eventually most imported cases that we see are going to be related to a variant. And that's what we would expect with, with uh, uh, you know, a virus that spreads more quickly than the original form. Uh, so we based our advice and our recommendations on that, um, on that knowledge. And so right now we certainly, um, we certainly are uh, sticking by those recommendations. Uh, as we get more people vaccinated, as the rest of the country gets more people vaccinated, if we see you know, there's a significant impact of that on spread. Um, if we see that case numbers are starting to go down uh, elsewhere, um, and uh, if we feel that, you know, we're more comfortable with the epidemiology, then certainly we will be looking at that. We reassess things on a regular basis. We're always asking those questions. We meet as a team on, on a regular basis, three to four times a week, and we ask all of those questions as to, you know, what measures we have in place and if we can change them. So, uh, you know, it is something that we're continually reassessing, and but right now it, it stands as it is. Thanks. Our next questions are from Danielle Edwards with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Thank you. Um, I wanted to ask, and I think this is best directed to Dr. Fitzgerald, of the AstraZeneca vaccine doses that um, are rapidly uh, getting close to the expiration date of April 2nd, how many have been used so far? Um, is there any concern, are there any concerns, sorry, about any weight? Um, so um, clinics that are happening this week, both in Eastern and Western, should actually use the last of that uh, vaccine that was due to expire at the end of this week. So uh, we don't anticipate a lot of wastage uh, with regard to that vaccine. And in fact, there was quite a, uh, uh, a quite a good response actually to the uh, call out in Western Health. So uh, we're quite uh, quite pleased about that. Um, and I also want to ask, with the information that we've gotten from um, the NACI about the concern of people under 55 um, being administered with the AstraZeneca vaccine, um, are there any plans to, to put the vaccine to one side for certain age groups um, with future shipments of AstraZeneca specifically? Um. So at the moment, we'll be offering AstraZeneca, um, you know, in the age group that we've indicated, and certainly um, we're looking at exactly how we pivot and, and do that appropriately at this time. Um, and in the coming days, I expect we will have um, we will have more definitive uh, information about that. But right now, the um, the goal is to offer in the age group that uh, the 55 to 64 that we've uh, indicated, and that can be for. Uh, most priority groups, so um, we'll be uh, um, we'll be looking at that a little more closely in the next day or two. Thank you. Our next questions are from Kellyanne Roberts with NTV. Please go ahead. Thank you. When it comes to vaccinating, um, are we looking to vaccinate through through weekends on evenings? Um, people just concerned that we're not utilizing the time available. Um, the um, regional health authorities are running vaccine clinics uh, certainly into the evenings and certainly on weekends, uh, whether or not uh, specifically with relation to Good Friday and Easter Monday. Uh, 
Uh, I would actually have to go back and check. Excuse me. Um, I, I honestly don't have an answer to this weekend, but previous weekends, certainly, and previous evenings, they have. Thank you. Uh, Premier, the Registered Nurses Union has sent a letter to you about nursing shortages impacting care in communities across Newfoundland and Labrador. They say the province has made promises that they haven't seen any movement on yet. Just looking for your response on this. Uh, thanks, Kellyanne. I haven't seen that letter. Uh, did you say uh, you broke up a little bit there? You, did you say the Nurses Union? Yes, the Registered Nurses Union. Yeah, no, we've had uh, some good conversations throughout the COVID outbreak uh, with the, the new president of the Nurses Union and looking forward to having good discussions into the future. I have not uh, seen that letter uh, yet, but I look forward to reading it and, uh, and working with them into the future to address the nursing needs. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Jackson with The Telegram. Please go ahead. Uh, hi, I'm talking about the 80,000 figure. By my count, you'll need to administer up to 4,000 doses a day of vaccine before Easter to reach that. Is that possible? Um, uh, I'm not sure where you get 4,000 doses a day. Uh, that figure was from March the 29th. So we have, uh, we have five days and um, just over 17,000 to do. Uh, I don't see a challenge in that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> and uh, this is a question that always comes up, uh, but I have to ask it again because I hear it from a lot of quarters. Uh, if capacity is not an issue here, why are we consistently uh, at or near the bottom of the scale when it comes to per capita vaccination in this country? Well, you can go ahead, uh, Minister, but we're not is the answer. Go ahead, Minister. You can get with the, you can deliver the technical details. I was going to say we're not. A lot of it is down to uh, a variety of factors. We, for example, I mean, there's a shipment of Pfizer that really had no time to cool off in the province before Central Health had it thawed and were administering it uh, literally uh, within 24 hours of it coming. That is fairly typical. We are a territory. There are um, transportation issues. We've had clinics cancelled on uh, the Port of Basque area, for example. We had a two-day weather hold for the coast of uh, Labrador. Uh, so it, depending on what day of the week you look at it uh, and what day you pick your figures for in and out, uh, you will get a percentage that varies between 60 and 95%. Uh, and that is not at all outside what you see in other jurisdictions. Okay, thank you. Our next questions are from Richard Duggan with BOCM. Please go ahead. Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, how concerning is it for you to see that the South African variant has reached our shores? Um, well, you know, we're concerned about uh, the variants in general. Uh, I'm not surprised that we've seen cases of it. It's, it's expected that we would see cases of this variant. Um, you know, we have people who are traveling for work. We have people who are traveling for other reasons and are traveling to areas where we're seeing more of this variant. So, um, you know, not surprised that that's happening. Uh, we're seeing it in other places in this country. So, um, it's uh, we obviously any variant that is uh, more easily transmissible, and especially this one, which has you know some vaccine um, escape. We certainly um, are concerned about it uh, getting into the uh, into the province and spreading. Uh, thankfully, this the person that we you know that had this is um, he they isolated quite uh, appropriately and had no further contacts. So. That's all really good, but that uh, just shows the importance of following the public health measures and you know, making sure that uh, quarantine rules are followed, making sure that we all do our part to try to limit spread of uh, COVID as much as we can, so making sure we're keeping our contacts low and maintaining our distance. It's all really important to, uh, to reduce the spread of any variant really within, within the province. And what do we know about this variant? Um, how is it different from the strains that we've already seen here? Um, so it's a little bit different. And, and um, basically what we're seeing is that it's, 
It's got some similar mutations so that it can spread a little bit more easily than, than the other, uh, than the original uh, COVID variant. Um, and uh, in addition to that, it appears to have some mutations that um, uh, for some reason allow it to um, not be as susceptible to the vaccine. Um, and in particular, uh, um, we've seen some of the viral vector vaccines that, that that's been an issue with. So, um, you know, it's, uh, it's slightly different. I, I couldn't really get into all the details of how it's different because uh, it's a little bit out of my scope, but um, you know, it's uh, it, the biggest concern for us right now is just how easily uh, these variants are transmissible. And, and that's the most important uh, reason why we need to make sure we're keeping our contacts low and following those public health recommendations and guidance. Thank you. Our next questions are from Peter Cowan with CBC. Please go ahead. As the weather starts to warm up and businesses try to figure out what the summer is going to look like for tourism, uh, Dr. Fitzgerald, I'm wondering if you can provide some context on what specific things are you going to need to see here and in the rest of the country for you to determine that it is safe to open up and allow tourism? Um, so for... Um I guess, first of all, <laughs> allowing tourism is, is not necessarily what I would say. It's just uh, removing travel restrictions, and then what happens after that, I guess, is, is what happens. But um, we um, obviously, you know, vaccination rates will play a role in that. I'd like to, we certainly would like to see uh, a positive um, vaccines that have a positive effect on transmission, obviously. Uh, we'd want to see a good proportion of our population vaccinated as well as in the rest of the country. Um, we'd certainly want to see reduction in rates elsewhere in the country, um, as well as uh, maintaining our own rates um, at a low level. So uh, all of those things really would be important for consideration uh, when we make recommendations with regard to, uh, to travel. And this is a question I'm hoping to get a response from both uh, Dr. Fitzgerald and Minister Hagee on. Uh, how important was the contact tracing team in getting the most recent outbreak under control so quickly? How important was the contact tracing team? Very. <laughs> yes. Uh, they were a, they were essential. Like there there would we would not have gotten that outbreak under control without that contact tracing team. We did, um, you know, there is a lot that went into making sure that that, that, that outbreak came under control. Um, contact, tra uh, you know, aggressive contact tracing, aggressive testing, that was really important. Um, the uh, restrictions that were put in place, that was really important as well. Uh, but uh, making sure that we found every case of, um, of COVID uh, in the province was certainly um, very, very important. And uh, to be honest, everybody had to pull together to do, to do that. We had to bring in extra contact tracers. We had help from other regions uh, in addition to everybody in Eastern Health, all hands on deck there. And uh, I have to say they did a fantastic job. And uh, yeah, we wouldn't, uh, we wouldn't be where we are if we didn't have the team that we had for sure. Peter, um, imagine trying to change a flat tire on a truck without a jack and without a tire iron. That's what you're doing if you don't have contact tracing in the middle of a pandemic. It's crucial. You can't live without it. Thank you. Our next questions are from Danielle Edwards with the Canadian Press. Please go ahead. Hi. Um, this question, I think, is record, uh, best record to the minister. I just had a question about that number you've mentioned, 600 appointments having to be rescheduled due to inclement weather. Um, is, are there any concerns that that's also going to get in the way of pushing back the, the goal of having 80,000 vaccinated or 80,000 doses administered, uh, rather, by the end of the weekend? Yeah, yes, that's my slippage. Uh, that's where I think we may come adrift. Uh, we may make it up. We had an excellent response, for example, for the, the open call in Western Health that... Uh, Dr. Fitzgerald referenced, there were 480 appointments. The uh, website went live at uh, 4.30 last night, and by 8 o'clock this morning, 417 of those appointments were already filled. 
So uh, um, uh, Eastern Central Health, we're actually waiting for um, the vaccine to uh, be checked out by Pfizer and the temperature control uh, before they started administering today. So vaccine delivery uh, is, is the key to this. And, and I think the slippage there may well just be around that, uh, that weather hold. Okay, thank you. No further questions. I will now go back through each reporter to see if you have one final question. Kellyanne Roberts with NTV, do you have a final question? Yes, mine's referring to the mobile testing unit in Grand Falls, Windsor. It's open eight to eight, seven days a week, um, but it's close to the long weekend. So for those who are getting procedures done on Monday and Tuesday and need a test done previous, they're now having to travel um, away from the community. Their fear is that the testing site is going to close permanently and move to Gander. I'm wondering if this is something that is in the works. That's an operational issue for, for Central Health. Uh, I've not been advised of any substantive change to testing sites across uh, Central Health. Indeed, I've not been advised of any substantive change to testing sites across any of the regional health authorities. Those are operational issues that are probably related to the holiday weekend. Um, Central Health would be able to provide some more clarity about that. Thank you. Peter Jackson with the Telegram. Do you have a final question? Uh, I do, and I'd like to follow up on vac vaccination numbers. Um, I'm wondering, Dr. Hagee, in the uh, interest of transparency, and since you claim the province of performance is up to 20% better than that regularly posted uh, on the National COVID Tracker Hub, would the department be willing to post or provide fresh vaccination numbers on a more frequent basis to demonstrate that? One of the uh, challenges that we've had around uh, vaccine is reconciliation. A lot of the rural sites rely on a paper base, so uh, there's, a, there's an inherent lag in there. And we also, unfortunately, yet have uh, two or three different uh, electronic systems before they feed into the, the COVID tracker. Certainly, um, uh, reporting of vaccine uh, uh, administration uh, is uh, something we've looked at, and whether or not we should report it slightly differently in terms of numbers of vaccine shots given daily, uh, for example. But again, there's a, a kind of lag issue there. Number of appointments kept, for example, may be another more uh, uh, readily accessible daily statistic. But uh, uh, if there's some particular way of reporting you'd like, Peter, please let us know. I will. Thank you. Richard Duggan with BOCM. Do you have a final question? I do. Um, given the number of variant cases being seen across the country and the fact that we have now seen two variant types in this province, um, are we considering more asymptomatic testing or other forms of testing such as uh, point of entry to catch the variant? Um, so those are all things. Well, certainly we have uh, instituted some with rotational workers and uh, we are looking at uh, how best to use testing um, for um, variant detection. And uh, we're working on that with essential workers is our next group that we're, we're focusing on. And so, uh, yeah, we are, um, we are looking at how testing can be helpful in this, in this regard. So. Peter Cowan with CBC. Do you have a final question? Uh, I do. Uh, we saw the federal government announce that nationally there's 5 million doses that were going to come late in the summer, now going to come in June. For this province, that should work out to about 70,000 or so uh, doses. What does that do to our vaccination timeline? Well, uh, Peter, we're still w working on the actual timeline and what implications it will have, but it certainly uh, gives us a buffer into, as uh, Minister Hagee said at the very beginning, making sure that we reach that uh, July 1st, end of June deadline and even allow us to provide perhaps uh, the second doses a bit earlier. Uh, depending on what research comes out and what evidence is available, uh, you know, not to speak for Dr. Fitzgerald, but it could even o open up potential for uh, children, depending on what evidence is available and how we change our, our guidelines based on that evidence. Danielle Edwards with the Canadian Press. Do you have a final question? Yes. Um, I am curious about the variants as well considering that there is a South, well, a case of a South African variant has been found. Um, are there any concerns that there could possibly be um, an outbreak because of the, this particular variant as, as there was uh, earlier this year 
due to the UK variant. Um, do you mean an outbreak as a result of this case, or um, yeah, just in yeah. no? Um, the uh, the case is uh, now recovered, and uh, and there's been no onward spread of of the variant in this case. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Premier, do you have any final comments for today? Well, thank you all for joining us today. Again, uh, another good day in Newfoundland and Labrador with respect to COVID-19. Let's continue, though, to keep doing our part uh, to keep the numbers low and to keep that momentum moving forward as we reach for higher vaccination numbers. Uh, please uh, continue to support local businesses where you can, especially those in the hospitality and tourism uh, industry. Uh, they've been particularly hit hard in, in this pandemic, and I and I know they appreciate uh, everybody's uh, support. Uh, so please enjoy safely uh, following the public health guidelines the, the Easter weekend if you're inclined to celebrate Easter. Thank you. Thank you, Premier. Stay safe, everyone.